Hola Church, welcome, welcome to Richway. We're going to invite you to stand and worship with us in Spanish. How about that? Put your hands together, church, for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah.
worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus.
chapter 16 verses 18 and 19 and I tell you on this rock I will build my church Jesus is declaring and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven so father we thank you God that you built this church Ridgeway Church this body of Christ upon your solid rock the rock that is jesus we thank you father that you've given us the keys to your kingdom lord on christ alone our chief cornerstone and no other foundation can we build upon not philosophy or the wisdom of man and all other ground his sinking sand so we sing out upon this you will build your church you will build your church and the gates of hell will not prevail Hallelujah. when we bind and loose when we bind and loose we proclaim your truth and in jesus name we will not fail we will not fail
down See, build your church Build your church Build it from the ground up It's your church Come on, declare that Build your church Build your church Build it from the ground up It's your church Build your church Build your church Build it from the ground up It belongs to you, Jesus Build your church Build your church Build it from the ground up Build your church Build your church Build your church Build it from the ground up It's your church Build your church Build your church Build it from the ground up Say hop on this You will build You will build your church And the gate Church, build your come on, church. Build your church, build it from the ground up. It's your church. Build your church, build your church, build it from the ground up. It's your church. It's your church, Jesus. We will build our church on you build our lives on you. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in
will put say we will put our trust in you and we will not be shaken and we will not be shaken he's holy he's good his mercy endures forever they're new every morning he rose from the dead he rose from the dead death is no more for us saints death is no more for us saints death is no more whatever the report is saying whatever your circumstances are saying we have eternal hope in our king a gentle powerful dying savior on a cross on a cross rose again so that we could have life so that we could have communion with him and that doesn't start when we pass it starts now that starts now. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he
death. Hallelujah. Because he lives, all fear is gone. And the saints sing, because I know he holds the future. we thank you that you are alive you live oh lord just because you live we can face tomorrow so god we thank you that we don't worship a a a god who is buried or is hidden but you are alive you have resurrected from the tomb and holy spirit you are present even now with us today and so god we thank you that in the places of death that it feels like there's death god you bring life in the places of sickness god you bring healing in the places of sorrow lord you bring joy so god in the places of feeling lack oh god you bring contentment because you live and so father we just pray this morning that our hearts would be open to you that we would experience the your aliveness you're with us god the fact that you are with us this morning god that you are the victorious one the majestic one you are the glorified one god we give you glory and honor this morning and so lord in in wherever it is that we need to hear from you lord would you open our hearts our ears our eyes to see you to be in wonder of you to love you to adore you this morning and lord in places that are difficult in the barren places of our lives lord god would you come and fill the, those places with life life oh lord whether that's a home whether that's a workplace whether it's a family situation lord we just pray for the barren places lord that you would come and bring your very life oh lord thank you lord jesus we love you and we adore you it's in jesus name that we pray amen amen you may be seated good morning church good to see you thanks manny Good to see you this morning. I've got a few announcements for us for to take us into November a little bit. Um, first one is that our Family Harvest Festival is coming up. Yeah, you can make some noise for that. Um, this is one of the most exciting and fun outreaches that we do every year. You don't want to miss it if you've not been to one. This We didn't have it last year, but this year it's going on. You don't want to miss it. Next Sunday, October 31st, from 4 to 7. And it's really a great opportunity. If you've ever wondered, man, I really want to invite this person or that friend from coworker or a friend from school, whatever it is, to church. This is a perfect opportunity for you to invite them. A, a way for them to meet people from our church, but also just get uh, to have a lot of fun. It's a Family Harvest Festival There'll be tons of games and rides and inflatable, um, inflatable like attractions for children, candy, tons of candy, face painting, arts and crafts, and so it's one of the, it's it's something you just don't want to miss. So put that on your calendar. And costumes are to be fun, um, but not spooky. Uh, next one is uh, our baptism service is coming up, and so one of the ways we worship is that when we worship, we're really offering all that we are to God, right? We we worship, yes, musically uh, by singing and declaring who God is, but it's really a dis- worship is really saying, yes, God, we orient our lives towards you. We say yes to you. And so baptism is a way of us publicly declaring that we have decided to follow Jesus. And so if you are new or if you've just decided to follow Jesus or you've been walking with Jesus for a while and just haven't taken this step of obedience, we would love for you to consider getting baptized on November 24th at 6 30 p.m. We're really excited about this. It's one of the highlights of the year. Every year is our baptism service. And if you notice on the back of your chairs or the chair in front of you, um, there is a QR code. And if you scan that, you will be able to just click a link to get baptized to fill out a form. And And so yes, feel free to scan that if you are interested in getting baptized and having someone just talk you through what it means to get baptized. 
Um, and lastly, one of the ways we worship is through our financial stewardship, through our giving. We give of our, our service and of our talents, but also of our money as a way of saying, God, this is what, this is belongs to you. This is yours first and foremost. And so we want to be obedient in offering to you what you have given to us. And so we'd love for you to consider um, giving to be part of what God is doing here through Ridgeway as well as in Westchester County. And so there's three different ways that you can give, but you can find out more just by scanning that code on the back and it will direct you to a giving page as well there's a link there for that and so would love to invite Ashish up today to kick out off our Philippian series I don't know if you've noticed but uh, the church is in a challenging era uh, there are scandals that discredit us, break our hearts. Our message receives more criticism and suspicion. Our influence uh, wanes in the public square. Um, there are people, pastors, who preach for, to build their own kingdoms, their own platforms, rather than uh, sacrificially for the kingdom of God. And there is incredible pastoral fatigue. Uh, I can't tell you the number of pastors I've talked to in the past year who've left ministry or experienced significant pastoral depression or even stories of suicide um, that have gone, uh, gone out of their lives. We are in a challenging era. And it is fitting that we kick off the book of Philippians this morning because Paul writes to a church that is faithful during a challenging era. And let me give you a little bit of a short background uh, to the book of Philippians as we kick off this morning. Paul, he plants this church in Philippi, which is modern-day Kavala in Greece. If you were to go to Greece today, you would go to Kavala, and there's Philippi. It's the first time that the gospel reaches European soil. Up until this point, it's really in the Middle East, it's in Asia Minor, and then finally it makes its way west into Europe for the very first time in Philippi. Lydia, who is a businesswoman, she's a seller of purple, she comes to Christ after hearing Paul's preaching. A house church is born, and this church is an incredibly generous church. And this is the church to which Paul writes uh, this letter to. Fast forward a few years later, both Paul and the church uh, are in a challenging situation. Paul is in prison. This is one of the uh, handful of prison epistles where Paul writes a, an epistle, a letter to the, to the church uh, in a particular place, and here he writes to Philippi, the church. So Paul was in a challenging place because he was in prison, and the church too was in a challenging place because of uh, two reasons, both uh, external and internal. Internally, externally, if you were to ask the church of Philippi, the church of Philippi, how's it going? What's going on? They were to say the church of Philippi was experiencing intense persecution. It is not good to be a Christian because of the slander, the discrimination, the theft of property. People would steal our stuff. Uh, there's verbal and physical abuse going on, and there's imprisonment. People are being thrown in jail and being, again, verbally and physically abused for their faith in Jesus. And you were to say, what's going on, Church of Philippi? What's going on internally? How, how are things going inside the church? And you would say, not that great because there's pressure building inside of the church. There's fighting. There's ego clashes. There's Paul even names names in chapter 4 of Philippians, uh, Eudia and Syntyche, right? He tells, break them off, right? Make peace, he tells them. And so... This is an incredibly challenging time that the church finds itself in. And with that in mind, we're kicking off this five-week series that we have in Philippians, right? Uh, how many of you are really excited for the book of Philippians? Like some of you, right? They're like, I'm still not over the challenge. Okay. Uh, I, I, so I'm going to let you in on a little secret, a little preaching team secret, is that so we've, we've organized this preaching series this fall, uh, five weeks in Jonah, five weeks in Philippians, really for you to get a chance to get some scripture in your life, for you to go through Jonah, again, four-chapter Old Testament book, and we've got Philippians, again, a four-chapter New Testament book, so this way you get a good diet of the Word of God, amen? And so again, this is a really short book, four chapters. You can read this every day at breakfast for the rest of this week, and you'll have covered it multiple times over. You can listen to an audio Bible. Uh, again, multiple ways for you to uh, take in this book of Philippians. Again, very short book. If you were to sit and read it, you can probably read it in about 10 or 15 minutes, um, because again, it's a very short book. Um, 
Philippians 1 in particular is a gem. We're going to really focus on verse 27, but I really want to encourage you. Philippians 1 is a gem of a chapter for you to pray through. And so, if you, you know, morning time, if you feel like you're stuck in your prayer life and you're like, man, I just need to kind of reconnect with God in a meaningful way, I would really encourage you. Philippians 1, it is really, really powerful. Paul greets the church and then offers a, a prayer uh, from verses 9 through about 11. He says, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. In the succeeding verses, Paul gives an update about how he's doing in prison. And, you know, verses 12 through 26. And at the end of that verse, he says, listen, I'm not sure if I'm going to see you because I'm going to be in prison. And so I'm not sure if I'm going to see you ever again in person or not. And with that in mind, this is verse 27. This is really the life force of the entire book of Philippians right here in verse 27. And here's what it says. It says, whatever happens, whether I'm going to see you in person or not, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus, of a uh, gospel of, 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 of Christ, then when I, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. And this is what I want to talk about this morning, a life that is worthy of the gospel, a life that is worthy of the gospel. Someone were to ask you, hey man, what's your life about? What, what, you know, where's your life headed? And you were to say, Man, my life is about the gospel. Like, I want to live a life that is worthy of the gospel. Can you imagine at your funeral, right? I'm just going to take myself as an example, man. You know, Ashish died, you know, and, and you know, he had, you know, okay, I'm not going to find myself. Uh, and you were to say, like, what was he about? What, what kind of a guy was he? Tell me a little bit about Ashish. And you were to say, like, man, here, here, here lies Ashish, a man whose life was worthy of the gospel. What a phrase. What an arresting and powerful picture Right, that Paul points and then Paul draws out for us to aspire to. If you were to think about, man, what's the North Star of my life? Right, and Paul here is telling, like, this is what we go for. This is what our lives are directed towards to live a life that is worthy of the gospel. And Paul offers in this chapter three ways that we can live a life that is worthy of the gospel. The, the first uh, way that we can live a life that is worthy of the gospel is uh, right here in verse 27, living a gospel-centered life. Giving, living a gospel-centered life. The beginning of verse 27, it says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. So the gospel, it literally in Greek means good news. Uh, this, what is the good news? Jesus came into, fl into the flesh, into human history, died on our behalf, decisively defeated death, darkness, and sickness, uh, rose again, and he's victorious, and he's won. Right? He has bankrupted hell, and he's opened up life for us. That is good news, right? Because of this new king and the kingdom that he has inaugurated. And so if you were to take a scale, right, we, we don't earn, by the way, our, our life because of uh, there's no, you know, no work salvation, right? We don't work our way towards salvation. But, but think about this for a second. If you were to take a scale and you think about the beauty and the majesty and, and Jesus bankrupting hell on one side, and then we've got our life on the other side. Right? All of our lives, our hobbies, our interests, what takes up our time, we take our schedules and we put it there, the things that we like and love to do, where our life is headed, the ambitions that we have, the desires of our heart, the longing of our life, and you stack that on the other side, how does that weigh in light of the gospel? Right? How does that weigh in light of the gospel? Right? How heavy would this be? How, you know, would it be lifted up? Would it be, you know, the gospel would weigh it all the way down? Would it be fluffed? Would it have substance? What's the, what's the character of our lives? What would that reveal about who we are? You know, this phrase, live your lives worthy of the gospel, this would immediately grab the attention of the church who was listening in Philippi. And the reason why is because the Greek here is the word polyteomai. Uh, polyteomai. Say that again. Polyteomai. Polyteomai, right? That's a way to kind of remember it. And it literally means to live as citizens of the polis. Live as citizens of the polis. Now, this word polis or, uh, you know, poly or polis means city or city state. Uh, it's the root of many different English words that we have as it pertains to corporate life together. So think about polity, 
right? Or politics or metropolitan or like, you know, Minneapolis, right? The, or Indianapolis, right? Again, that idea of a city. And so um, the meaning of one's life was determined by the polis, by the city that one belonged to, right? So, you know, very different life that we would live if we lived in New York City or in the suburbs of New York City versus if you lived in Detroit, right? Life would look different. The infrastructure, the industries available would look, look different. So the careers you probably ended up in, the kind of relationships that you have, right? All of those rhythms uh, get affected by the kind of city that you live around, right? So institutions, laws, customs, manners, language, philosophy, worldview. Uh, and so no matter if we live in Jerusalem or Athens or Addis Ababa or Hong Kong or New York City, uh, our lives are shaped by the cities that we live in or around. It determines our uh, daily life, how we treat one another and how we spend our money. Now, the Philippians, they were conscious of their, their privileged status as a Roman colony. And so they were one of the five cities that were granted the privilege and the high right to be governed by Roman law, but to be exempt from direct taxation. So while the rest of, you know, the lands that are under Roman authority are taxed heavily and mercilessly, here's Philippi grandfathered in, enjoying really good status. And the thing is, if you live in Philippi, I mean, you're really proud of the fact that you're from Philippi. You know, it's kind of like a little bit of like New York pride a little bit. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, I remember the first time I went to Boston when I was in, uh, in college, and I remember like one of my friends saying, "Like, hey, here we are. Here's downtown Boston," and I'm like, "Is there more? Is this it? Like, is this this looks like downtown White Plains? Like, you know, like where are the skyscrapers? Give me, give me like some, you know, give me some huge buildings." And I'm like, "No, no, it's just flat, and uh, we're here. It's that's a lot of fun, you know." And I'm like, "Take me back. Like, I need to go back." Right? How many of you have that kind of pride or like, this is an urban life? Like, come to New York City. Like, I'll show you what urban life is. You know what I'm talking about, right? That kind of pride that we have that, you know, we need to repent of at some point, right? Um, so, so Paul, so the, even for the church in Philippi, they have that kind of a pride about what it means to be a, a, a Philippian, you know, what it means to be from Philippi. And what Paul is writing here in a masterful stroke is he's telling the, Philippi, the Philippians who are so proud to be identified as Philippians, New Yorkers who are so proud to be identified as New Yorkers, that we now live in a new polis, a new city, a new kingdom. One that is centered around Jesus and his kingdom. A new kingdom, a new dominion, a new culture, a whole new way of ordering human life. There's a different reality to which uh, we now belong to. And Jesus calls us to live, uh, you know, in our area, in our context as gospel politans, if you will people who are shaped by the reality of the gospel. Now, I know for many of us in the room, many of us might have not been born in the United States, right? And so uh, I, know, I know there's a few of us that I've talked to, and so you might have been born outside. Or if you're an immigrant American, right? If you're a second generation, like, you know, Italian American or Hungarian American or Colombian American or, uh, you know, Indian American, or I know there's a lot of other groups here as well. I'm just, I'm just giving you a quick sample size, right? And you know what it's like, for example, I'll take, I'll take, you know, me, for example, Indian American, that you're kind of balancing two different worlds and two different cultures at the same time. You know, the only people who don't do this are New Yorkans. You know, you just, you just blend it in. You're like, we're going to be one thing. We don't want to be two things, you know. Uh, we're going to stand apart as our own, own thing. Um, okay, so, so this idea that you've got two different cultures going on, right? So for those of you, you know, around Americans, you feel Indian, and among Indians, you feel American, right? Kind of a thing of like, man, how do I, how do I fit in? How does my culture, you know, kind of fit in? And, and you might even have like two passports or something like that, and you're kind of living in the tension of two cultures, right? You know what I'm talking about? That, that, that sense of you've got two languages, and, you know, that affects your parenting, and that affects your friendships, and sometimes you blurt one language, you know, as you're speaking another. And so that kind of idea, right, where you've got two cultures, two streams coming in, and that's a vision of how we are to live in our context as followers of Jesus. That we've got, we are in the world, but not of the world, right? We are living in this world, but with a totally different kingdom value system. That the hardware is the same, but the software inside looks very different. It operates, right, and responds and is responsible to a different king, right? And so, uh, John Piper, uh, he writes this, he says, bring your life into conformity with your true homeland, heaven, right? That heaven is our true homeland. 
That when other people demand our allegiance and our utmost affections, we must remember whose we are, that Jesus alone is worthy of our worship that Jesus alone is worthy of our affections, that we may be citizens of the United States or any particular nation, just as they were citizens of Rome, but this is just our earthly home. And no matter if you are miles away from the town you grew up in and you've been in the same area for all of your life, the reality is that every single one of us, we are foreigners in a foreign land. We may love our country, but we can't worship our country. We may align with one political party more than other, but neither can save us. We are to live a life that is centered on the gospel, that our priorities are Jesus' priorities, that our time is Jesus' time, and our uh, money is Jesus' money, and all of who we are belongs to Jesus, right? To live with a different system Internally, even as we live in this cultural context. We are, li- we are called to live a life that is worthy of the gospel, first by living lives that are centered on the gospel, and the second is to strive for faith side by side. Strive for faith side by side. In verse 27, towards the end, when Paul writes this, he says, I will know that you stand firm in the, in, uh, in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel. See, just like the church in Philippi that had both external and internal forces that looked to divide and distract the church, so too we, right, in our climate today that we've got things uh, externally, whether it's political situations or it's got uh, ideologies or opinions that seek to divide us, that seem to detract us, that seem to distract us from Jesus and his kingdom, and so, and, and there are things even internally, right, within personalities or, you know, commitments or things like that that get in the way of our uh, cohesion as well. Paul sta- tells us to stand firm in one spirit, striving together as one for the, fake, uh, for the faith of the gospel. And, we, and the reality is that you and I, we cannot live lives that are worthy of the gospel in isolation, Right? We, can't, we can't do this on our own. We actually need each other to be able to encourage one another, to spur each other on towards living lives that are worthy of the gospel. Uh, John Tyson, in his book, A Creative Minority, he talks about what does it look like for the church to be living in a culture and a climate that is, con- you know, that is not conducive, that is allergic, if you will, to the gospel. And what does it mean for us to be the church in, in, in such a, situ- you know, such a um, climate? He calls, call, calls for this idea of a creative minority. And he says a Christian community is a web, I love this, of stubbornly loyal relationships knotted together in a living network of persons in a complex and challenging cultural setting who are committed to practicing the way of Jesus together for the renewal of the world. Right, what, a, what a beautiful picture of what it means to be the church during this climate, that we are to be a stubbornly loyal, how many stubbornly loyal relationships do we have in our lives? Right, like stubbornly loyal, not, not, not like passively nice, but like stubbornly loyal. Like, hey, like I'm not letting you go, like, like Ruth to Naomi, you know, like where you go, I go, you can't get rid of me, right? Like stubbornly loyal relationships, knotted together, right, in this network and in this complex and challenging time who are committed to practicing the way of Jesus. Why? For the renewal of the world. John Mark Homer, who's a pastor and thinker from Portland, one of the most secular cities in the U.S., he says this, that the church must be a thick web of interdependent relationships between resilient disciples of Jesus, deeply loyal to the way of Jesus. The church must become a thick web of interdependent relationships. Why? Or, 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 or who's to do that between resilient disciples of Jesus deeply loyal to the way of Jesus, right? That in this complex and challenging times, what we need is, what we, not, what we don't need is watered down faith or just like Sunday Christianity, right? Like that, that clearly doesn't work. What we need in this challenging time is resilient disciples, right? Who come back stronger and more together and connected to Jesus and his church and his purposes in more meaningful ways through difficult times uh, than quit on their faith or, or, or water down during this particularly challenging time that you need me and I need you desperately. We need each other. To live a life that is worthy of the gospel, we need each other 
desperately. We're called to live a life worthy of the gospel, first by centering our lives on the gospel, second to strive for faith side by side, and third to to embrace suffering for the gospel, to embrace suffering for the gospel. Verse 29, it says, "For for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, two things, you ready? For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Now, quick thing here, you know, like, you ever shop at Costco, and you get, like, you know, like, assorted flavors, like, no no matter what you're getting, cereal boxes, or, like, you know, uh, like, seltzer or something, and there's always that one flavor that you really like, but there's always that one flavor that you really don't care about, you know what I'm talking about? And then you're like, I'm gonna give this to somebody else, like, and you just, you know, like, I don't like grapefruit, you know, and you, like, give it to somebody, you know what I'm talking about? There's, like, this mixed bag, and you're like, I'll take the first one, you got the second one, right? When, When we talk about life with Jesus, right, how many of us are, like, believing in Jesus? Absolutely, part two twin combo pack here comes suffering and you're like no thank you give that off to somebody else i don't want to see it right i'm signing up for the first part and here it is paul putting it together and he's saying it has been granted on behalf of you this is he this has been granted to us that we believe in him but also to suffer for him since you are going through the same struggle you saw i had now you're going through the same thing that i'm going through is what paul's saying and he's in prison and now here that i still have When we think about lives that are marked by the gospel, we have to remember that the gospel involves suffering. Suffering is a part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That we can't look at a crucified Savior and say, Lord, why is my my life getting difficult because I'm following you? We can't look at a Savior with the cross mounted on his shoulder on the way to the cross and say, Lord, Where's the comfortable life I signed up for? You can't follow a crucified Messiah and expect comfort. Right? This is actually a part of what it means to follow Jesus. That suffering is a part of what it means to follow Jesus. Now, I need to nuance this a little bit and clarify what that means because there's two kinds of suffering that I want to distinguish. One is natural suffering right? Suffering that is sickness or, or, or disasters, things that we don't sign up for, right? That just visit upon our lives most, most times unannounced. And then there's gospel suffering. And gospel suffering comes from making Jesus, his kingdom, and his purposes the absolute aim of my life, right? That there's an allergic reaction that we, we experience because Jesus is the king of my life and the surrounding environment you know, is not conducive to that. Here's an analogy for how I'm going to put the, uh, you know, how we can think about this, perhaps in this way. Imagine if you had a gluten allergy. I have like a mild gluten allergy, but I'm largely in denial. How many of you have a gluten allergy, right? Gluten allergy. Let's just pass the bread and the cup. I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. Um, Gluten allergy, right? So you've got breads and this kind of stuff you just can't have. Either you'll, you know, break out in hives or you've got, it'll upset your stomach or you just have the strong response against gluten. Now imagine if you have a gluten allergy but you work in a bakery. Right? Like how difficult would it be for you to live life when you have a gluten allergy working in a bakery? You've got your mask on, hair nets, you're all covered, you know, from head to toe, and still, right, like you start to sneeze and or cough, and you're like, I promise I don't have COVID, right? Like, and, and you're, you're trying to make sense of like, how do I work and, you know, manage this allergy? You've brought your gluten-free, like, lunch, you know, in the lunchroom, but there's like gluten everywhere, and, and like it somehow gets, someone sneezed or coughed and like gluten got on it, and, and you're trying to desperately live this like gluten-free life while working like at a bakery, right? Like, just think about that, right? And, and that's, that's similarly, like, what it means to follow Jesus in this climate, right? We've got this internal system of Jesus being the king of our lives, a, a, a different ordering of life based on the reality that Jesus is king, his kingdom, his purposes, internally, but externally, we're an environment that is allergic to that, right? That doesn't lend itself, right, for us to be able to uh, live this life that honors Jesus, Right? And so as a part of that, suffering is a part of what it means to follow Jesus. St. Augustine, the North African bishop, writing in the fourth century, he says this, he says, all those who belong to Jesus Christ are fastened with him to the cross. Right, as Paul says, we've been crucified with him. As followers of Jesus, suffering is a part of what it means to follow Jesus. And again, there's lowercase suffering and uppercase suffering. 
right? Uppercase suffering in terms of the persecution, it's, it's physical, right? There's a physical manifestation to it and a dimension to it. I grew up in Saudi Arabia in the underground church where if, you were, if, if, if somebody caught us doing what we're doing right now, talking about Jesus and his word, like every single one of us, we would be in jail, right? That's the reality of like how I grew up in church. We grew up in house churches, much like the early church, and if we got caught, all of us, and if we were outsiders, like foreigners, like we would all get deported to our countries for, for following Jesus, right? So this uppercase S, suffering, and then there's a lowercase S, suffering, which is, again, this, this kind of, you know, um, indifference, what I call a value incompatibility with what it means to follow Jesus in our particular climate. You know, for, for many of us, you know what this looks like, this in deep value incon, uh, in, incongruence or incompatibility, right? Even when you're family, for many of us, we are the only people or one of the only people in our families that follow Jesus. And you know the angst of that, that every time you get dressed up to come here for a Sunday morning or like a Bible study or in a community group, and your family looks at you like, why are you doing this? Right? This makes no sense to me. Or you say, I have decided to follow Jesus and I want to get baptized and I want to, and I want to invite my family to be part of the celebration. And they were like, why? Do I need to come to this? Right? You, you know what that's like. Right? When we try to live as followers of Jesus. And again, even some of the things that we as a church invite each other to do. I mean, these are like weird things when it compares to the culture. Right? Even, even something like Rooted, for example, the culture might say, why join a Rooted group for 10 weeks with strangers? Sharing your story, being in this daily devotional, serving, pressing in prayer, learning about who God is. I mean, why do that? And many of us might respond by saying, because I want to develop a thick web of relationships and I want to grow as a resilient disciple of Jesus and I can't do this by myself. When we talk about even something like giving, the culture might say, why? Why give 10% of your money to church or, 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 or back, to, back to God and his purposes? You made that money, keep it. What's the point of it, right? Because what we do in acknowledging, what we do when, when we do that is we acknowledge that all of our money is God's money and I wanna give God a tenth of what he has given me as a way of acknowledging, Lord, this is yours and not mine. All of what we have is yours. Even another weird thing that, that we ask right, each other to do is serving, Right, even in serving, like, like why serve in kids' ministry? Why serve in hospitality? Why serve on the tech team? Just go to service and just go home, right? Why get plugged in? Why take the next step? Because we might say, because I want to raise a countercultural generation of children, youth, and young adults who follow Jesus against the, you know, counterformative ways of secular culture. Man, like, I want to respond to the tide of that by actually personally investing, right, in the next generation of people who are going to carry the gospel forward in Westchester County. I want to create opportunities for people to meaningfully encounter Jesus. And so I'm going to give of my time and my talents so that people who don't know Jesus may come to know him, right? Even many other questions. Why do we pray and seek the kingdom of God to come? Why do we look to honor Jesus in our singleness? Why do we look to honor Jesus in our marriage? Right? There's a deep value incongruence with who Jesus is calling us to be and the environment that we have around us. We are called to live a life worthy of the gospel. First, by living lives centered on the gospel, to strive side by side for the faith, and then finally, to embrace suffering for the gospel. You know, this morning as the worship team leads us, I want to invite you to think about, where's my life like? Remember that scale that I talked about? Like, think about the scale, the beauty and the power and the, and the majesty, and, 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 you know, all across history and all across the world, right, of people who've encountered Jesus. Like, you've got the gospel on one side. And you've got my life, my own ambitions, my own hopes, my own dreams. And you were to say, what have I been building my life toward? What's the aim of my life? What's my life about? Have you ever taken inventory of your soul and say, what are like the deepest desires of my life about? If you were to take, again, your behaviors and longings and hopes and things you spend your time on, and you were to put them together and you were to come up with, hey, here's what my life is about. 
What does that look like in light of the gospel? Are we living on lives just for ourselves? Or would it be said about us that we have lived a life that is worthy of the gospel? Church, if you could rise to your feet, you can and worship with us and sing and pray this song along with us. We meditate on the word. So, God, we, we place it at the feet of Jesus. We place it at the foot of the cross, and we say, Lord, have your way in our lives, God. Have your way in our lives. God, we pray that we would live lives that are centered on the gospel, on the good news that, Jesus, you are king, and so we don't have to be, Lord. And, God, we, we even pray, God, for unity, Lord, to, to, to strive side by side, God, that we would strive for your faith, Lord, in our generation, in this climate, God for you, Lord Jesus. And God, we pray that, God, we would embrace suffering of the gospel, Lord, that we would uh, experience, God, the the, the beauty and the power and the majesty of Jesus, Lord, when it gets difficult, God, to live, uh, Lord, as though there's a gluten allergy in a bakery, Lord, for us to live in this climate during this time, God, for your sake. And uh, before I, you know, kind of pray and bless us, I always want to, you know, just get any sense and you know, this, this altar is open, and for I wonder for some of us, perhaps this morning, the Lord is inviting you to like rededicate like your uh, life, perhaps, or ways for you to say, Lord, I, you know, kind of faltered off, but, but Lord, I, I want my life to be about your life. I want my life to be about who you are, Jesus. I want my time to be Jesus' time. I want my priorities to be Jesus' priorities. And as I look at the inventory of my life, I want all of who I am to be about who Jesus is. Not my will, Lord, but your will be done. And so if that's your heart prayer, I simply want to invite you to the altar at the end of our time. And if you'd like prayer ministry, we have uh, Brother Trayvon and a few of our leaders who'd love to pray for you right here 
at the altar. But again, just want to create that space for you to say, Lord, I just want to come and I want to rededicate my life. And if we can pray and bless you, we'd love to do that. So Lord, we just pray a blessing, Lord, that our lives would be, Lord, marked by the goodness of Jesus and, 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 and Jesus' gospel, Lord. God, we pray that our lives would be uh, lived in a way that is worthy of the gospel, Lord. We pray that more than what people read or more than what people see, God, they would experience the, the life and love of Jesus in our lives, God, through our character and our conduct, God, and through the very things that our life is absolutely about. We love you, Lord Jesus, and it's in your name we pray. Amen.